and we're very happy that he's with us today. And um, he's a consultant in sports and exercise medicine at the Institute of Sports, Exercise and Health. And he has traveled with national squads to four Olympic and five Commonwealth Games, the World and European Championships. Um, so we're very happy to have him here today. Um, so yeah, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for asking me to come and talk. Um, thank you, Clement, for your patience and getting me on the Zoom call. So I'm going to talk about what is sport and exercise medicine this evening. Uh, I don't know, we're going to do questions at the end. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. I've got about an, uh, sort of 40 minutes to an hour's worth of material, uh, and we will just go through that. So, so I'm Dr. Mike Lucemore. I'm a professor of sport and exercise medicine uh, at uh, University College London. Uh, I was the first chair in sports and exercise medicine there. It's a comparatively new chair, and it's a, well, it's a new chair, and it's a, a new category of medical activity. I started um, working in boxing. Boxing's my sport. So I started working in boxing in 1991. And uh, at that stage, nobody was really doing anything particularly. Uh, and I was became the, 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 the doctor for the GB boxing squad in 97 which makes, means I've been doing it for 25 years now. <clears throat> uh, and we had uh, the chair of the, because if you were the, the doctor in charge of a national sport from a medical point of view, then you got onto the Olympic, the GB Olympic Medical Committee, where they had all the doctors from all the sports. And those days it was just a, a ragtag bunch of doctors who usually were either interested in the sport or whose children were involved in the sport. I remember that the, um, the diving doctor was a, a, an ENT surgeon who, who both her daughters um, were in the diving team. And in 1997, uh, Richard Budget, who was the chair at the time said, does anybody fancy doing bobsleigh? And I thought, well, that sounded a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, I like, Power sports it sounds exciting. So I was just about to put my hand up and he said, does, any, does anybody have, uh, do you, uh, I assume everybody has qualifications in sport and exercise medicine or sports medicine at that time. And I said, and I put my hand down again because I'd never heard of a qualification in sports medicine. Didn't know such a thing existed, but there'd been a, an MSC set up at uh, the Royal London Hospital in 1991 and then subsequently one in Bath and in Nottingham. And I, because I was working full time, uh, did the Bath uh, diploma, did a diploma in sports medicine. And then I did uh, uh, an MSc in sports medicine. And then subsequently a PhD in sports medicine. Um, and I was working at the, uh, the Olympic Medical Institute the OMI, which was then based at Northwick Park, uh, where we had we could look after Olympic athletes on a residential basis. Uh, the English Institute of Sport had really just started and started funding sports uh, in around about 2001, 2002, and it started in 2002. And so I was working at the Olympic Medical Association. Uh, and in 2005, uh, we won the Olympic bid for London, which was, well, one, it was a surprise uh, because we thought Paris was going to win. In fact, I was so convinced that Paris was going to win that I went, I didn't go to Trafalgar Square for the announcement. I just stayed at the Olympic uh, Medical Institute, which was a mistake, one of many. And uh, so we won the bid for 
the Olympics in 2012. And this was in 2005. And part of the bid was that sport and exercise medicine would be recognized as a speciality within the NHS, which is fine. Uh, but they, that was sport and exercise medicine. And the idea was that it wouldn't just be sports medicine, it would be uh, the idea that people would get fitter and improve their health. So we started uh, running around London looking for uh, people who could do training. Well, first of all, we had to set up a, do a curriculum. Then we had to get part of a Royal College and we became a faculty of the Royal College of Physicians of London and uh, the faculty of the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. Um, and then we had to set up a curriculum which we, that we were going to teach. And then we had to go around finding places that we could, could teach. So it's a, it's a four-year training course, uh, ST3 uh, to ST6 covering a, a wide range of, of different topics. And the, the range of topics really reflects where sport and exercise medicine sits. I mean, sports medicine really is quite a small part of, of what we do. And if I like to think of other specialities as longitudinal specialities. So you go in at the bottom and then you go to the top and then you become a consultant. And it works within that speciality. So if you're a surgeon, you, you get your patients in at the bottom and you, uh, you uh, operate on them and then they, you see them in outpatients and you discharge them. Whereas sport and exercise medicine is more of a horizontal speciality. It goes across the... Um, the subjects, it goes right across everything. So everything you can think of, and maybe you can be jotting some down to ask me questions later, but everything you can think of has something to do with uh, sport and exercise medicine. And we can help all those other specialties to improve the lot of their patients by working with, with us to provide uh, advice on, on getting the patients fitter. Uh, this isn't really being used as much as it should be at the moment, but we hope that in the future things will improve. So we've, we set up, we saw off, we had our first registrar in 2006, and we've now obviously at 2022, uh, we've gone through, gosh, 16 years of, that's right, 16 years of registrars, wow. Uh, so most of the registrars now are, um, are now qualified and doing a great job doing sport and exercise medicine throughout the UK, although the, the training in Scotland unfortunately has now stopped and the training in Northern Ireland has stopped and the training in Wales has stopped uh, because the powers that be don't realise how important this subject is. So that's just a bit of background. <laughs> I haven't even started yet. So. Um, so sport and what I do, why is exercise important? Is exercise good for you? Sentry behavior. And then we're going to do a bit on um, saving the planet, just to show you, give you a good idea of how broad the topic is. So first of all, I'd just start out on sport. Um, so these are the countries that I've visited uh, to do with sport. There's probably more than that now, but uh, that's in Europe. Uh, sorry, that's in the rest of the world. I've, I've now, of course, done uh, Brazil and Argentina as well. And this is just traveling around with sport. Uh, this is when we went to India for the Commonwealth Games in Delhi. Uh, I am the one on the right. And of course, going and doing sport you know exposes you to different cultures and, and and different places which is one of the aspects of it that i enjoy i don't really like going to smart places i i, I quite like to see places in the raw um and again this is the this is when they were building the 
building the the facilities in New Delhi for the Commonwealth Games in 2010. Um, and there were and there were, there were there were women. One thing I remember was women carrying gravel on their heads and dumping them on a pile. So they were going on a they were getting them from a pile on the outside of the stadium, putting it on their heads, and then dumping it in the pile on the inside of the stadium. And I said, well, you know, why don't you just get a big digger and lift all that gravel in a bucket and dump it inside? And they said, well, that's fine, but what will all these what will all these people do? Which I thought was a good point. Uh, this is Beijing, a bit different Beijing. Uh, that's the Bird Nest Stadium, which was amazing. Uh, China was very much no expenses spared. They're still the most expensive living, uh, the, the most expensive Olympic Games ever produced. Forty-four billion pounds they spent on that. And uh, this is, a, I like this slide because it's got the bird's nest, but it's also got the lights along the side of the path, which are also little bird's nests. Nice detail. Uh, it's the opening ceremony, which was pretty amazing. Having a good time. Uh, this is in Russia. Um, at the, uh, this is at a boxing tournament, European Championships, and this is just one of the massive, uh, Soviet <clears throat> statues to uh, space flight and exploration. Uh, this is Ankara in Turkey. Uh, that's on the top of the walls of uh, the An Ankara Castle. As you can see, health and safety, not a high point uh, in Ankara. Uh, some basils in Moscow. Uh, Great Wall of China. I did uh, obviously the Beijing Olympics was near the Great Wall, and then I did a, a boxing tournament right at the end of the Great Wall of China, where it goes into the sea, the so-called Dragon's Mouth. Uh, that's a, I think that's a sea anemone. It was in China in a soup anyway, and it was, it was a delicacy. So I took a photograph of it. Uh, Tasted of seawater. Uh, this is uh, London 2012. Uh, Rio, Rio, uh, medals. From various Olympics. And then uh, I also look after the snow sport team. Um, you may think that snow sport and boxing hasn't got much in common, but there are several things that it has in common. Uh, one of which is the propensity to get hit on the head. And, you know, we get a lot of big wipeouts. This is big air, which is just great. Um, um, but, you know, with all these things, um, snowboard cross, uh, half pipe, whatever, there's always a chance of landing on your head. Um, and you can land pretty hard. Sorry, that's the, the helmet after that particular landing. Fortunately, not concussed, apparently, but there you go. Uh, half pipe is interesting. The half pipes are getting bigger and bigger and people are getting higher and higher off the half pipes, which is great if you hit the landing properly. But if you don't hit the landing properly, then you can you know, give yourself a severe head injury or indeed kill yourself by breaking your neck. This is Ski Cross, which is just such fun and insane. And in Pyeongchang, a third of the, the men that took part in the uh, Ski Cross got injured. Uh, not just this wasn't the GB team, this was across the whole of the sport. And that included, uh, uh, there was a fractured pelvis, there were two fractured backs. Uh, there was a fractured femur. There was three tib and fibs. I mean, it was a, it was carnage, absolute carnage. And that's the that's the finish of a uh, <laughs> snow cross race, where the person standing at the end won. So that's uh, that's a very brief um, shimmy through sport. Uh, 
as I say, I didn't include any slides of boxing, really, a couple of boxing medalists. But boxing has been my main, my main focus over the years. I've also been chief medical officer for England athletics, um, England fencing, England bobsleigh, funnily enough, and the snow sports as well. So part of this uh, project that we were given by the government leading up to 2012 was that we were going to train people in sport and exercise medicine. And really, the, the exercise medicine bit was the bit that nobody was really sure about. There wasn't really much idea of you know, what exercise medicine was or what exercise medicine could be. So I asked uh, an American colleague who had set up exercise is medicine in the States uh, to, to help out. And he came over in uh, 2007, I think, and gave us some really interesting talks, which I found amazing and changed my whole attitude to uh, physical activity and what it can do for you. So is exercise good for you? Uh, well, the answer is obviously yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't have said that. So regular physical activity reduces the risk of heart disease by 40%, lowers the risk of stroke by 27%, reduces the risk of diabetes by almost 50%, reduces the risk incidence of high blood pressure, uh, can reduce the mortality and risk of recurrent breast cancer by almost 50%. That means that if you've had breast cancer, if you exercise regularly, you can reduce the risk of a recurrence of that breast cancer by 50%, which I think is an absolutely extraordinary figure. So that's the same as taking tamoxifen. I'm not saying you should take, do exercise instead of taking tamoxifen, but perhaps you could do both. Extraordinary figure. It can lower the risk of colon cancer by 60%, and can reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease by a third. It can decrease dep depression as effectively as Prozac or behavioral therapy. And it actually can also be very effective in <clears throat> major mental illness as well, um, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Uh, people that uh, undertake a physical activity program can improve their, their symptomology in, in both those serious their psychiatric conditions. And the other interesting thing about exercise and, 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 and severe psychiatric illness is that most people who have severe psychiatric illness die of other things. They don't die of their psychiatric illness, they die because they don't do any exercise and they, they, they smoke a lot and uh, they die of heart, heart attacks and strokes and cancers, all of which can be improved by being more physically active. And there's been some really interesting programs done in psychiatric hospitals looking at um, improving physical activity within uh, psychiatric hospitals, which has been very effective. So <clears throat> change in activity and the adjusted risk of death. So this is relative risk of mortality against energy expenditure or exercise. And you can see the more you exercise, the relative risk of mortality reduces. For the statisticians among you, obviously the risk of uh, mortality is 100%, but the relative risk reduces if you exercise. So if we look at um, the effect of uh, cardio uh, respiratory fitness on mortality, if you look at all the uh, things that may reduce your risk of the instance of relative instance of mortality. You can look at low cardiorespiratory fitness, so obesity, smoking, hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes. The biggest one is low cardiorespiratory fitness. It's bigger than all the others, <clears throat> and it's bigger than obesity, high cholesterol, and diabetes combined. And smoking, sorry. So, and we know that smoking, uh, diabetes, all have huge amounts of state money spent on them 
to try and reduce the risk factor. But is there a huge amount of money being spent on low physical activity? No, there is not. Should there be? Yes, there should. So this is the uh, this 100 men, 101 men with stable coronary artery disease, and this is training versus angioplasty. So if you look at uh, exercise versus angioplasty, uh, you can see that uh, this is um, this is the number of people that had uh, no symptoms. Uh, after one year. And in the exercise group, you're up at sort of 85%. Angioplasty group, about 70%. So just by doing physical activity, you are better off as far as symptoms are concerned than you are if you have an angioplasty. And the cost of exercise is much lower than the cost of angioplasty. So why are we still doing loads of angioplasties and not putting people into exercise regimes? I don't know. So physical activity and the risk of hip fracture. This is the nurses study, which is a, a, an American study following a group of uh, nurses, uh, all women. Um, I know that that's uh, not necessarily the case, but these were all women, 61,200. So good numbers there. And you can clearly see that the more exercise you do, the risk of hip fracture reduces almost in a straight line. And if you're doing more than 24 hours per week, then you can reduce your risk by 55%. And exercise and dementia. Um, and if you exercise more than three times a week, you can reduce your risk of dementia by 40%. And this is probably because most of the dementia is caused by uh, cardiovascular disease and, and multi-infarct dementia. So this is this is the um, this is where we get the reduction here. I'm pretty sure. So looking at physical activity in the Amish community, uh, where as you know they have no cars or electrical appliances, labour-intensive farming. This was a sample of 98 adults, and there were no obese men and only nine obese women, which is incredibly low. So we all know this, this is all, this, these are all facts. So clearly, because we're an intelligent group and a, an intelligent population, everybody must be more active than ever, mustn't they? However, since the 1960s, Adults are over 20% less active, and by 2030 will be 35% less active than they were in the 60s. And since the 80s, uh, by, if you look at traveling on foot and bicycle, it's 25% less. If you look at screen time, it's doubled. And screen time is, is, a, is a measure of being sedentary because it's either looking at, as we're doing now, looking at our computers or looking at phones or tablets or TVs. Young people playing extracurricular sport, it's halved. Lots of reasons for that. Um, teachers not being available to do extracurricular sport being the main one. Working in a physically active employment, it's halved. And if you think about it, it's half because we have developed ways of doing things without using uh, manual labor. So manual labor has virtually been removed from our environment, which you know, is a good thing. And you get things done much more quickly, a bit like in India when uh, you know, the, the women were taking gravel in on little baskets on their heads. They, I said, why don't you use a JCB? Well, in the UK, they'd use a JCB and all you get from that is, is moving your hands around, sitting in a cab. So physical activity, inactivity is responsible for one in six UK deaths. Long-term conditions, up to 70% of long-term conditions are due to inactivity. And the annual cost to the nation, 
estimated uh, it was 7.4 billion. Uh, this slide was written a few years ago. So with current rate of inflation, it's probably twice that. So why are we, why are we inactive? Because we know we should be active, but we're not. And that's because we are programmed um, by evolution to not be active unless we need to be searching for food. And as we can get food pretty easily now, we are pretty much inactive. So we used to be, so the genetic paradox is that we, we, we are really endurance hunters. We're designed to be endurance hunters. Um, we have no hair on our bodies, unlike other monkeys. We've only got hair on our heads to protect us from the midday sun. And we've got endurance. And there's not many other animals with endurance like we've got endurance. Horses, possibly. Camels, possibly. But we have got really good endurance. And so endurance hunting is finding a, a water buffalo or something in the middle of the day and then chasing it in the heat of the sun. It then becomes exhausted after about 20 minutes, stops running, sinks to the ground, and you can just walk up to it and, and cut its throat without any problem at all. And then, of course, you know, 10, 20,000 years ago, once you'd killed your water buffalo, you wouldn't need to exercise. And in fact, why would you exercise? Because you're using up vital calories, which to get more, you have to go and kill another buffalo. So you'd rest. Once you were sated, you would rest. The trouble is we are now sated all the time. So we, we are switching into energy conservation mode all the time. We don't have to go out and do physical activity. And the other issue is that that the 20th, in, during the 20th century, we have worked on labor-saving devices. And we've been really successful at it. So we now have removed physical activity from our lifestyles. So previously, a cleaning cupboard may have been, you know, buckets, mops, brushes. Now we have, you know, vacuum cleaners and we have... Uh, we have uh, washing machines, tumble dryers, dishwashers, etc. And so if you think about uh, a domestic chore uh, 60 years ago, which may have been, for example, boiling some carrots, you'd have to go into the garden, dig the carrots up, carry the carrots in, wash the carrots off, cut the tops off, cut, peel the carrots, cut the carrots up, put them, in, put them in a pan of hot water, put the hot water on the stove, boil it up, drain the carrots, serve the carrots to eat. And now what happens is a van comes to your house, drops off ready chopped up carrots in a bag, you put it in the microwave, you press the button, it goes ping. You have carrots to eat. So all that physical activity is taken out of our lives. Now that may be a good thing, but we still have a huge amount of physical activity taken out of our lives, mowing grass. So what about children? Well, obesity, childhood and obesity goes up um, as the children go through school from 9.3 uh, 9 to 9.6%. So one in eight children start primary school clinically obese, one in three children start secondary school clinically obese or overweight. So that's, that's increasing just between five and 12. And this is an area that I do quite a lot of research in. And it's stark when you go to schools and you're doing um, jump tests or hand grip tests or weight height waist circumference tests on children and all the little five-year-olds are buzzing around and they're all not fat and then when you come to the 10 11 12 year olds some of them can be really quite obese i had a a 10 year old who was 83 kilos uh 
one in three, uh, obesity is twice as much in deprived areas. The more deprived the area, the greater the chance of obesity. And, and this is all about um, opportunity uh, and the ability to be able to be physically active and the ability to buy better food. Uh, more prevalent in boys than girls. Uh, year six obesity is up to 30% in some regions. Only 60% of children consistently play sport. That's a worldwide figure. It's around about 16 to 21% of children play sport on a consistent basis. And children spend an average of six hours a day in front of screens. That's a, that's a measure of inactivity or sedentary behavior, which is a separate risk factor from not being active enough. And of course, um, health and safety, uh, trying to prevent people uh, getting injured by not walking up the steps and also the inconvenience of um, children playing. So lots of time spent in front of tablets. And now, of course, esports is becoming bigger and bigger. And there's now talk of uh, esports being in the Olympics in Los Angeles, amazingly enough. But there you go. And this is all of us, all of you, sitting and looking at your phones all the time. I expect some of you looking at your phone now. And even kids are using tablets and phones, which I understand because it does, it does shut them up almost immediately. Um, it's extraordinary seeing children being absolutely fascinated by moving pictures on tablets and phones. But again, it, it means they're sitting still, they're not doing anything physical. So we know this, we have guidelines. So for children, it's at least 60 minutes of moderate activity, moderate to vigorous intensity of physical activity every day, including incorporating muscle strengthening activities at least three days a week. That's quite a lot. So who's achieving it? Well, 23% of girls uh, meet at age five to seven. Uh, as they get older, the levels of activity fall away. And again, there's this socioeconomic difference between the two groups. 47% of boys and 49% of girls in the lowest economic group are inactive. Inactive. That's less than 30 minutes of moderate activity a week compared with 26 and 26% and 35% in the highest quartile. So it's getting worse. Uh, some people say up to 20 million Britons are physically inactive. And again, physically inactive by in this definition means that they are doing less than 30 minutes of moderate activity a week. And there was there's some really good studies looking at uh, the way that exercise levels declined long before adolescence. So, the, so for adults, the recommendation is 30 minutes of moderate activity, five days a week, plus two sessions of uh, resistance activity plus reducing your sedentary behavior plus uh, sleeping well, which is fine. That's uh, that makes sense. And really, it's probably the reason that this is the, the, the reason that this is the levels of activity that's been uh, picked is because. As you increase your activity, and this is increasing activity, showing a reduction in relative risk mortality, but as you increase your activity, you get to it. At the beginning, you get huge gains, but then it starts to tail off. So the government picked a sort of point around here where doing more activity wasn't making much difference. And that's the reason you've got those uh, recommendations. But I think that 
I think that's, I think that bar is too high. I think if you ask most people to do 30 minutes of moderate activity, five days a week, plus two resistance sessions, plus reduce sedentary behavior, then they're going to struggle to do that. And the thing is, when you ask people to do stuff, then uh, that's impossible to do or very difficult to do, then they don't decide, oh, I'm going to do a little bit of that. They do nothing. And that's the problem. So I think sedentary behavior is where we should look. This is the skull chair. So sedentary behavior is just sitting still, it's doing what we're doing at the moment. And sitting is, when you're sitting, you're, you're virtually metabolically inactive. And you're starting to uh, lay fat down around your middle and you're starting to produce all sorts of uh, toxins which affect your endothelium. And so sitting down and, and being sedentary is, is not a good thing. And we're doing more of it, as I described earlier, because of you know, because of our, our sitting in front of computers and uh, our phones, et cetera, et cetera. So we recognize now there's two separate health risks. There's lack of fitness and there's also sedentary behavior. Like you could say, there's two risks for heart disease. One could be smoking and the other could be low cholesterol, uh, high cholesterol. And we know that if, you, if you're not doing anything and you do something, you reduce, your, you reduce your relative risk of mortality really, really quickly. So for me, it's, it's the group of people that we talked about earlier who are inactive, who if we can get them to do something, if we can get them to do some sort of uh, physical activity and not be sedentary, I'm not talking about sport, I'm talking about not being sedentary, you can make a big difference to the public health. It's a bit like a gearbox. And uh, this was proposed by Professor Buckley. Um, and if you're, if you're sedentary, you're in reverse. Now you're not gonna get to 30 minutes of moderate activity, five days a week, plus two sessions of strengthening activity, which is fourth gear. Because if you do that, there's gonna be one, there's gonna be a crunching of gears and the, the car's not gonna go anywhere. You've gotta work through the gears before you get up into to fourth gear. So if we look, think of sitting down as reverse, then low level human activity, which is just standing and moving around, then occupational and domestic activity, and then human transport, walking or cycling to work. And then fourth is act, uh, leisure activities, going to the gym, you know, playing sport. Unfortunately, most of the rehabilitation programs funded by government sit here at, the, at level four. And that really only helps people at this level. I think what we've got to do is try and get people from sitting to low level human activity, and then we will actually start to make some progress. So sitting less goes a long way. Uh, and these are all the research articles on this. Uh, sedentary behavior is an independent and separate risk factor of lack of exercise and probably more important. MRI scan studies show fat around the organs, bad, I put bad fat in. Fat around the organs is associated with sedentary time more than you know, BMI. Reduction in, a reduction in sitting reduces glucose and insulin levels. Reducing sedentary behavior improves mental health. Reduction in city, sitting reduces back pain and muscle fatigue. Compared with those who sit least, those who sit most have twice the risk of developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Compared with those who sit least, those that sit most have a 13% increase in cancer incidence and a 17% in increase in cancer mortality. I think that's a huge statistic. Reducing sedentary behavior improves productivity, equality, and teamwork. So if you introduce three hours of standing into an eight hour working day where you're normally sitting, you will live on average two years longer. And 
you use it's the same amount of calories as if you do three hours of standing rather than sitting at work a day for five days a week it's about the same number of calories as running uh, 10 marathons and it's it's worth about eight pounds of uh, fat Uh, and this was a really interesting study, and we're following up on this, uh, where they looked at, it's a really good study, they got kids at, um, uh, they got kids at, uh, when they started in at secondary school, and they did a bleep test on the first PE lesson of secondary school, and then they did nothing for five years, and they didn't do any interventions, I mean, and then they looked at their GCSE results and they found that there was a straight line graph between the level of attainment in GCSE and how well they'd done in the bleep test on the first day of uh, their secondary school. And we're now currently following that up with more sophisticated tests on general cognition in children and seeing more importantly that if we can get them to be more physically active, whether we can improve their IQ points. So far, it's looking promising. So I think I will stop there and leave the uh, environmental stuff out because that's going to take me another half an hour and um, it's very depressing. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take uh, questions from you. Uh, I had a question about um, when you were talking about angioplasty and you were comparing the cost of exercise versus angioplasty. I was wondering how that is calculated um, in terms of what costs are involved um, in exercise as, as a treatment. Well, that, that was a very specific um, uh, research experiment. So they, they brought them in and put them on a bike, uh, I think, three times a week and exercise them on a, on a bike, so in, in a lab. So they knew how much it costs for them to come in and uh, for the bike. So that, that's how that was costed for that particular experiment. It was, it was that costing. Thank I mean, you. if you've got your own bike and you pedal around, then you can do it for, well, you can't do it for nothing, but you can do it for less. Can I ask something just a bit more kind of like basic, I guess? I just want to know more about um, your day-to-day -day sort of life. Like as, as a SCM consultant, what do you do actually day-to-day? -day? Well, <laughs> one of the good things about, well, one of the things I like about my job is that my days are very different. So I don't do the same thing every day. Um, I do all sorts of different things. So, I mean, this week, gosh. Uh, so last, last week, last week on the Monday, I traveled up to Sheffield to look after the boxing squad on Tuesday. And I came back on Tuesday night and went, uh, yeah, and then, then I went and uh, did a clinic uh, a private clinic at, at the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Health. And then Thursday, I uh, did my NHS clinic in the morning. Then I flew to Azerbaijan. And then I taught on a master's course in Azerbaijan on the Saturday, Sunday and Monday. Then I flew back to the UK on Tuesday. Then I did my clinic on Wednesday. Then I did my NHS clinic on Thursday. Uh, then I had... Um, meetings about some research projects that I'm doing. Uh, my current research projects are on um, uh, concussion in sport, which is a, is a big one at the moment, using a, uh, uh, an instrumented mouth guard to gather data and then using uh, brain modeling to look at where the strain is going through the brain, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, doing the work with children, looking at schools and getting kids more active in schools by changing the teaching. And I had a a phone call about that uh, over the weekend uh, before the Newcastle Tottenham game because uh, I support Newcastle uh, have done all my life and my colleague supports Tottenham so we thought we'd better do it before the game rather than <laughs> uh, I haven't spoken to him since 
<laughs> not, 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 not for any other reason than I, I, I don't want to sort of ring him up specifically because we beat them. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, to tomorrow, I've got meetings about the Gumshield project, um, and then on Wednesday, I'm going to Amsterdam for the concussion conference, and I'm in Amsterdam Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then back on Monday. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing Monday. That so, sounds very busy and kind of incredible. I mean, I th I feel like, so I only discovered this type of medicine last week and right. I think I've already fallen in love with it. Like I think this is made for me. And I'm, well, I just, I've got quite a lot of questions. I hope you don't mind. No, no, crack on. Okay, great. Um, firstly, you said that it's quite broad. You said it was like horizontal, this, this yeah. type of medicine. It's hugely broad. You can do virtually anything you like. Well, so once once you've done your training, like, do you subspecialize whilst you're training, or like, do you are you do you cover everything, or how how does it work? Uh, the, the, the training covers everything, or, tr or it tries to cover everything. Obviously, you can't be super specialist while you're training, but it tries to cover everything. And then when you've finished your training, it's it's up to you what you what you look at really. Um, I mean, the as I say, I've been. I've been training the, the doctors now for 16 years. So a lot of my trainees are now doing all sorts of interesting stuff, working with, you know, from working with cancer patients, uh, which makes a difference both, uh, you know, we talked about stopping getting cancer, but once you've got cancer, uh, it can help you after you've had chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy, be, uh, to improve particularly mental health wise because people who've had those sorts of interventions and they're told they're cured and they just feel like crap um, and it's be often because they're deconditioned and if you can improve their conditioning they will feel a lot better if you can do um, if you can do uh, exercise whilst you're having a chemotherapy there's good evidence that it improves the uh, chemotherapy uptake and improves the effectiveness of the chemotherapy uh, so I mean I've got people working in cancer and, and also I've you know one of my registrars is now the doctor at um at Ars as the arsenal doctor so you can go from you know and you know various England doctors uh down you know to working with cancer patients to working with children there's, there's lots, I mean, I do, I, my other research project is on the homeless, looking, using, using um, sport and activity to engage the homeless uh, within society, which is a real, if you can engage, I mean, most people who are homeless have got either serious mental illness or addictive behaviours or both. Mm. And if you're going to help engage them in society, then you can help to improve their health and often their mental health because the mental health provision is shocking now mm. that's what it was 20 years ago oh okay so you had other questions <laughs> yeah so you also you mentioned that ireland wales and scotland have all sort of pull, pulled away from doing this type of medicine yeah so i mean is this lack of funding or like why why is that um it, I mean, everything's lack of funding uh i think that when you're making a decision to fund a course it's much easier to fund a speciality that is powerful and people understand what it is you know or orthopedic surgeons replacing hips <clears throat> that's a good thing isn't it is it a good thing yeah maybe it's a good thing um whereas the, the, the problem with sports medicine, as people call it, is that it, people just think of the Arsenal doctor. They don't think of all the other great things that you can do with physical activity and why physical activity is so important. So they don't see the need for the speciality. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in fact, it's the most, in my opinion, I may be biased, but in my opinion, it is the most important speciality mm -hmm. because it, it, it affects all the other specialities for the good. Plus, it uh, you know, plus it improves the bat. It in, it helps the planet as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that part of the talk. Mm. 
Um, yeah, sure. And so you said that this guy came over from America and sort of gave you this talk at the yeah. beginning, and that's kind of what gave you. Am, am I wrong in thinking that you sort of um, have set up the system that we have at the moment? You are correct. I helped set it up. I'm not entirely um, yeah. responsible for it, but I certainly helped set it up at the very beginning. Yeah. So I guess America were ahead of us in. in they were. Up. Yeah. Um, what other countries are out there and uh, can you learn like what what well as far as as far as physical activity is concerned uh the world health organization did a survey of countries and and the uk came out of it very badly we came out of it worse than um than america so america was more physically active than we were mm -hmm. which is a, a surprised me and disappointed me but is true mm -hmm. um the the nordic countries are fantastic on physical activity mm -hmm. um australia is is also very good and and scotland have, have set up very well uh, to do physical activity despite their lack of training they're they're very interested in getting the population more active because they can see the benefits for it uh, i just think the the reason that we failed to get more people active is we've given them an impossibly high target to try and reach mm -hmm. And for me, the people we need to try and reach are the people that are, are inactive. It's that 15 to 20 percent of the population that does less than 30 minutes of moderate activity a week. Mm. And these are these are people who are generally poor and they're the people that we should be like most other things, be aiming our, our money at. Mm. Uh, and and if we did that, then we could make a huge improvement in the, the, the public health of the country. But the, the government always insists on building football pitches or you know 50 million yeah. homes, i think it was on, on football pitches and all that helps is the 20 percent of children that we talked about mm -hmm. who do football regularly mm -hmm. you know it's not going to suddenly get and they're the top they're the top 20 percent of of activity uh, active children mm -hmm. so they're not gonna it doesn't matter what you do for them they're going to be active they're, they're going to be fine if you build new, you know, all weather football pitches, what you do is you improve the level of football, which you know may be something that the world wants and society wants. Yeah. But you know, you can't pretend that it's going to improve the public health because it's not. It's just going to make us have more facilities for people that want to play football. Mm -hmm. And maybe you know, twenty-two percent of people will play regular sport, but it's not going to be anybody from that fifteen percent who are doing nothing. Yeah, I understand. Well, then, what do you think? Like, um, I'll use the Nordic countries as an as the country that I'm the countries that I'm interested in because I, I know they're one of the happiest like countries in the world, and I'm sure that's massively related to the exercise. What kind of schemes do they have that you think that, that have led to them being better than us? I guess. <laughs> um, I think there's. I mean, some countries are very lucky to have you know to be flatter than us. Um, but I think the the the, inf the public infrastructure for um, you know public transport and the ability to ride bikes safely, for example, uh, to be able to walk to places uh, is helpful. Um, there's just a general encourage. I mean, the, the the work they've done in in Finland, I think it is. Yeah, I think it is Finland in schools to get kids more active. So what they Finland had a big problem that they were they were way down the educational league table, um, and so they they looked at what they could do to improve their education. And what they did was they stopped giving kids homework until they were ten and allowed them to participate with their families in family activities, and they increased physical activity in the school day, mm. and they're now top of the educational charts uh so and it's always a mistake uh to do less physical activity and to do more academic work the um there's a famous uh, thing in the states where they were trying to improve this this school was trying to improve their stats and so they reduced the pe lessons and in, increased their maths and english and uh, the results went down rather than up that's music to my ears because i love um there are a few people in this call that i know miss 
various like times to revise and by doing all the sport that we do at the moment um and it's nice to hear that that's actually a good thing for us yeah no, we, um, you should do you should have 20 minutes on and then 10 minutes doing something physical when you're revising you'll revise much better mm -hmm. um okay so okay, those are some questions on the the job itself what about for me if i want to become like you how you do i get don't to become like me I, i'm a very i'm a i'm a very sad creature who spends all their time doing sport and exercise medicine and research so i'm actually I, you know i've got no friends and uh, i'm divorced and you know you don't want to be like me you want to be a nice happy person who goes around doing good things um, i just do too much but that's because there's something mentally wrong with me so don't ever want to be like me. Are you doing your 30 minutes of exercise a day? Uh, no, but I'm, <laughs> I, I try to when I can. So I cycle everywhere in London when I go from meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've, I live on a, a small holding where I uh, am outside. I mean, I've been outside today, you know, humping stuff around and cutting things down and getting logs ready for the winter so I can try and reduce my massive fuel bill. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, don't don't want to be like me. Well, I'm. You've got a long list of achievements and the yeah. things that you're doing. I think are really impressive, and I think would make me happy as an adult. I, I don't. This is probably the first part of first thing that I've seen in my two years of well, one year and a bit of clinical experience. That I've been like, oh my god, I think this is perfect for me. This job. So, um, what kind of thing? So we also have another um, person that wrote in the chat who also said, what could they do. <laughs> It's not just Sarah, there's other people. It's related to Sarah's questions. I just wanted to know Sorry. what can you do in terms of placements and research? What can we do as students to kind of lead us into STEM? Because it's not something we get taught at uni at all. Mm. So and that's the and that's, that we can do. and that's part of the problem. I mean, what you're being trained, you're you're just being trained to poison people. That's mm. what you're being trained to do. Um, you know, you'll spend you'll spend ages looking at far you know you know the pharmacology of various drugs and, and how they work and you can achieve and you won't learn hardly anything about what you can do with physical activity and how you can buy you know changing lifestyle can make people better and the environment better so uh, it's partly to do with medical training that you won't learn a lot of this stuff um sorry what was the question <laughs> how we can kind of guide our way into this yeah. in terms of you know if we can do well, you've got, or... I mean you're the SEM society aren't you or have you got an SEM society mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay um you can look for re, you know look to see who's doing some research in this because I know there are people at Cambridge who are doing work on this um they are, for are they? Uh, they're doing work on uh, on on certainly on sedentary behavior and on movement work um I can't remember the names off the top of my head. Uh, so you can do that. If you're interested in learning about musculoskeletal medicine, which is the other sort of work that we do, looking after sportsmen and what have you, uh, then I would just see if you can shadow someone at the you know, the, the rugby team or the football team. Rugby is always good because they get such a lot of injuries. But uh, um, and just, just see what the, they're doing and you know, look over their shoulder. That's always a good good thing, gets you started. Mm. Um, I'm always looking for people to help out with, uh, you know, with collecting data for research projects. So when we're doing the kids' work, you know, I'm always looking for people to do waist circumferences and measure heights. And it's a bit of a hoot. It's, it's good, good fun for a day. It, it's it's a very mind-blowingly frustrating if you try and do it every day. But it's good fun for a day. The, the kids are hilarious generally. Um, so it's just, I'm afraid it's its usually a case of volunteering. Um, you, it, you can't really, before you're past uh, F2, you can't really do any um, unsupervised work. And, I, and I, you know, you've got to be a bit careful about doing un, uh, working with clubs where you may get sued and stuff. So but to do it as a shadow, as a volunteer, then you, you're absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, in regards to the job, there was just a, another question in the chat, which was, is travel a necessity for the job? No, not at all. It depends what you do. Um, I mean, I enjoy traveling. So I've, and, you know, I've, 
I'm getting to the stage now where I'm, I'm not traveling as much, having said that. Uh, I'm traveling quite a lot at the moment. And then I'm, next year I'll be traveling a lot because I'm covering, I'm working for the IOC, covering uh, all the boxing qualifications for Paris. So there'll be one in the Americas, there'll be one in Asia, there'll be one in Africa, there'll be one in Europe, and then there'll be two world ones as well. So there'll be six different tournaments all around the place. Plus I travel regularly to Azerbaijan, plus uh, you know all these conferences and things that I seem to go to. So there is, I think if you're doing anything at a, an international level now, there's gonna be international travel. I think it'd be foolish to think there isn't. Um, you can, you can reduce it depending on what you do. You, sport, sport and exercise medicine has covers lots of different things. So, for example, my colleague who's doing um, uh, cancer work isn't isn't travelling to do that. Um, although she did go to the states for a while to look at what people were doing in the states uh, from a, this the exercise and cancer point of view. And I've got another colleague who just does private musculoskeletal work. And, you know, does three days a week of musculoskeletal work and then spends the other four days with his kids, which is, again, perfectly legitimate and much more balanced lifestyle than mine. He wouldn't okay, give so a talk. He wouldn't give many a talk. options. He wouldn't give a talk to you lot at seven o'clock at night, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we've got another question that's very specific about boxing, but maybe I'll leave that to that person to, to email to you or maybe... Um, uh, directly, uh, that's okay. uh, yeah, I looked after, yeah, I looked after Nicola and Anthony. I get a mention in Nicola's autobiography, actually, which was very nice of her. Um, yeah, boxing's, boxing's very highly medically regulated. And we've just done some interesting work looking at the level of blows to the head during training and competition. And it's, it's not as hard as it, uh, as you think it would be. They're not compared with sort of rugby or something. Yeah, okay. Right, Sarah, you're back on. Um, so if I, I'm thinking now, maybe I should do my elective kind of related to it. Yeah. And so going abroad to underdeveloped countries where this type of medicine definitely won't exist. I know that, I mean, one place that I looked at was Kenya and then they didn't have a sports and exercise med medicine that's more just orthopedics. And I don't really just want to go watch orthopedics. Is there anywhere you'd recommend I go? Well, we're doing a we're doing a project in Kenya. Are you? What <laughs> summer? Uh, in the yeah, we're doing it. We're doing some stuff in the the slum area of uh, Kenya, looking at getting kids in schools more active. Can I come? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. I mean, contact me outside this meeting yeah. and we can see what we can organise for Kenya. Okay. Uh, but that just happens to be a country that we are doing stuff, something in in Africa. Um, the South Africans are doing some interesting work uh, as well. Um, but otherwise, you, you know, you're really looking at Australia or America. Mm -hmm. The Americans are doing some really interesting stuff, actually. It could be nice to see both sides of, I guess, like the underdeveloped and the developed and kind of, yeah, both ends of it. So maybe, can I, am I allowed to take your email or your yeah i think clement's got my email so okay that's great you're more than welcome to email me um okay that's because i think doing an elective base around this would would definitely give me some good insight into this that's all my questions i will stop <laughs> harassing right, you and no let problem. you do something else hi hi professor uh Lismo. Um, hi, yeah. thanks so much for the talk um is it is it all right if i contact you as well i have a couple other questions as well regarding yeah, unless, unless you think the group will be interested in them uh, unless oh, no, it's, 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 it's more them. about the it's more about the options of the kenya and possibly south africa which is which is what okay. i was yeah get, about. get in contact with me we'll see what we can do i'm not guaranteeing anything but we can always ask sure thank you amazing uh, does anybody else have a last burning question or comments or anything I think I think everybody else has run out of energy. <laughs> no, thank you very much. No, thank you for your time and also for answering all the questions. It was really a very insightful talk. And yeah, like I said, unfortunately, we don't get much of this at university, which is uh, one of the reasons we have <laughs> some sock society um, to try and, you know, generate these kind of discussions and learn about the topic and 
very thankful that you took your time this evening to speak to us about it. Well, we do taster weeks at UCL for people who are interested in sport and exercise medicine. In London, we've got 16 uh, registrars. We've got four in each year, four at uh, ST3, ST4, ST5 and ST6. So we've got 16 registrars at any one time. Um, and yeah, they're, they're an interesting bunch and they're, and they're interested in different things. All right. Well, nice to see you all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Give me a, give me a bell, Sarah. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Brilliant. In them as well. And thank you so much for organising this talk. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Yes, Clement. Clement put in the, the, the long yards on this one. So thank you for asking me, Clement. Thank you very much for coming to speak for us. No worries at all. Very helpful. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.